This is an interview for Peep Magazine. We're joined with Dr. Noel McLaughlin, popular music historian and lecturer in the Department of Arts at Northumbria University, co-author of Rock and Popular Music in Ireland before and after U2, classed as definitive. His latest book, How Belfast Got the Blues, is available now. I will put the, um, the links in the description and I'll flash it up on screen. Um, you can get that at Google Books, Amazon, and Waterstones, I believe. Um, and if you don't know where else to get it, you can contact Peep Magazine or contact Noel directly. He who controls the space controls the universe. Let's get into it. Okay, no, thanks so much for coming down. Uh, it's been, it's really great to see you. Uh, I haven't seen you for a few years, but um, for the people who don't know, me and Noel go way back. Um, Noel was actually my lecturer uh, a few years ago at Northumbria University. And um, and I, I kind of class you as a mentor uh, as well, Noel, but I know you, you, you're going to cringe and hate this, <laughs> but um, but yeah, yeah, um, how I started this interview and all as I said hey who controls the space controls the un- the, the universe <laughs> and uh, there's going to be themes throughout this because you're a big fan of Brian Eno mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm quite a big fan of his as well so I've done a bit of research on him I already knew bits and bobs but um, I'm interested in your perspective on Brian Eno as we get into it you know um, you Grew up in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Self-proclaimed, you said that you try you were trying to make music, and you didn't want to be mm-hmm. famous. You didn't want to be this uh, this person in the limelight. And I, I'm just quite interested to hear. Let's get into it. Let's uh, hear where it all began. But uh, well, back in Ulster. Well, first off, thank you very very much. I'm very um, flattered and humbled by um, your introduction. I mean, um, it's it's a wonderful thing to work doing something that you like and working amongst creative people and and you, you just hope in some way, some, some small way, you've been some of some value to them. But when you go back to those years, um, I was 14, 15, um, I grew up in a small village called Port Ballantrae, yeah. about 500 inhabitants, very, very beautiful in the, in the seaside summertime, totally dead like Siberia in the winter. And this all relates to finding your place. I mean, like, music was the thing that offered some magic. So down the road, four miles down the road from us, is the town of Portrush. Portrush is kind of Northern Ireland's Blackpool stroke Brighton, except an awful, awful lot smaller. Mm -hmm. But it had exotic things like a Big Dipper and a Cyclone and all of that, and a main street full of small venues and ramshackle hotels. And I would miss spend my youth, friends of mine, owned a hotel and it had a disused bakery up the back and we'd, we'd form bands and play things and I saved up and got a synthesizer. And this connects with your, your wonderful guest, Mick Clark, because mm-hmm. Mick was one of the music musicians who was involved in that era that I loved that seemed in those days very far away and and possibly exotic. Yeah. And that exactly. was that was the sort of the world of, you know, Joy Division and the early Human League and Cabaret Voltaire and Soft Cell and Japan even. Japan and all that British post punk electronic. I funny I was listening to Japan's Tin Drum last night. I hadn't listened to it in years. I got the the remastered vinyl of it and I've got a sound it just doesn't sound like anybody else before mm-hmm. or since. Mm-hmm. So I kind of then I was pretty crap at playing live. I wasn't really that excited by playing live, so I, I became really interested in recording. Yeah. And I'm of that generation, you know, where having a tape recorder, I don't know if you, if, I don't know, maybe you're a, a generation a bit, you're a bit, maybe a bit young for this, but being able to record things and play it, play them back was really exotic. I remember yeah. as a kid having one of the wee piano key sort of like tape recorders in a wee case. Uh-huh. And I'd just go around recording things. 
Mm-hmm. And then when Porta Studios, as they were called, came online, you know, basic four track cassette recorder, you know, I thought, oh, great. And so I became really interested in sort of studio stuff. And it was just something to do. Um, it was a way of kind of finding yourself. And I became this sort of teenager that, you know, was kind of ridiculously thin, um, long sort of bleached blonde hair, bit of eyeliner, bit of makeup, probably looked like a dog's dinner. <laughs> but it was a way of standing out, making your own world in Northern Irish society of that time. Now, I wasn't in the world, the deep, dark world of the Troubles. It seemed that we knew it was there. Sectarianism was in the air. But you were far enough away from it, up at the coast, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, it, was just, it was just a way of creating an alternate reality. And so I, I thought of myself more as a non-musician, following Brian Eno. Um, yeah. I mean, I had a few piano lessons when I was a kid, but hated piano lessons. Mm-hmm. And then a friend of mine, he was really into to, to recording too, so we, we both would kind of make this little uh, homespun studio couple of synths, bass guitar, drum machine or two. And then we'd build that up as the years went on. And and that was the that was the big deal for us. It was mm. something to do and we'd you'd sort of write imaginary soundtracks and and then when I got to university and got in to do media studies and it was a practical course like the one you did. Mm-hmm. And the most exciting bit for me was soundtracking the films that we made. So myself and my friend we have the you know get a portable TV in the studio and then we'd start trying to yeah. sync all this stuff up. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the finest stuff we did. Didn't have any vocals. It was uh, I, I just loved doing things like programming and making odd signs and mm-hmm. a, a bit per man's BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? was, yeah, yeah. Of course, I, it was just quite in, interesting that that you wrote because um, I was reading on your blog. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it's interesting that like you said uh, sounds of the um, interest and in, no interest in playing live, but it was like uh, amb- ambient sounds of the Himalayan fo- foothills and footsteps. <laughs> I just loved that. Uh, I just loved re- uh, reading that, you know, and like a deserted windswept island off the Greek, uh, uh, like a Greek island or something. And I, and I kind of uh, not em- not empathise, but I, I can relate to that because. When you're in, like, say, for instance, I, I, I'm not saying you were, but you, you read about all these kids growing up in count, council estates and mm. they always imagine they're somewhere else and they want to play exotic music mm. and, they're, and they're getting so influenced by, you know, big stars around the world. And, you know, I can totally uh, relate to that, you know, and it's it's re- really interesting. It is. It, but, was, uh, it, was, it was my friend, actually, uh, Don Ramage, who... Uh, it, made all these particular tracks with. I mean, there were cassettes and cassettes and cassettes of them. I've got very little of that stuff left. In fact, it was a mm. an ex-girlfriend of mine um, who sadly has passed away, Marlies Ludkin, who's some, uh, I gave her, uh, she wanted some tracks and I burnt them onto a CD. And and then I realised I'd never, ever kept them for myself. And Marlies and I didn't work out, but we remained friends over the years. And then mm-hmm. I didn't know she was ill with cancer. And she would come to London and come to Newcastle to, to visit me. I didn't know she was ill, but I mm-hmm. knew now with hindsight that she was visiting people close to her within this borrowed time thing. And, Got you. and the last time I met her, she put a disc in my hand and said, um, maybe you might like this back. Wow. And, uh, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have any of the sort of recordings. I mean, I mean, I can be, I thought I can be as vain as the next person, Cliff, but I, I've never sort of really held on to things too long. There's a mm-hmm. moment where you you, you kind of have to let go. And I suppose I thought, like, who's really going to want to hear this stuff? I was very flattered that, I, I mean, when I lived in London, uh, I mean, some folk were around at the house I was living in at the time, and um, the landlord, my friend, he put a track on that Don had done called Book People, and there was a guy in the room that was a David Sylvian fan, and... He thought it was a, a missing David Sylvian track and my kind of lance. So we were yeah. obviously trying too hard to <laughs> sound like people we liked. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I guess when computers came along, I um, something of the magic went out of it for me. Um, the, the, the computer became the centre of the way that you worked. And 
I loved old kind of analog synthesizers mm -hmm. because you, you know, all the knobs were and you play in real time and mm -hmm. make these bizarre sounds. Mm -hmm. And I remember when it was the Steinberg Pro 24, whatever it was called, came along and a friend of mine, he had one of these and he went through the learning curve. And I remember just not wanting to go there. Right. And then we got an offer of being signed by a controversial couple called, uh, I wonder if I should name them, or is this, this could be controversy. Um, they, they would feature heavily in the story of Sean Ryder uh, after he'd uh, left the Happy Mondays, shall we say. And mm -hmm. this was before then. And I remember them telling me that they were getting involved in managing Sean Ryder. And I thought, oh, that's brave. <laughs> and um, and they said, right, OK, we'll um, do a deal and we'll get you in the studio. And I remember they mentioned Don Letts, of all people, being the producer. And I remember even thinking at the time, how did Don Letts fit with these kind of odd tracks we make? And then my, my friend just said, uh, these people scare the life out of me. Um, we're, you know, we wouldn't last two seconds in a studio. Um, I mean, we do this for kind of other reasons. So if you want to go ahead and sign the paper, Noel, I'm sorry, but you're on your own. Right. And then I went, do you know what? He's absolutely right. Mm. And then somewhere you, you kind of, you, that's, that's your place for then. Mm -hmm. And then you have to find out, well, what am I actually going to do? How can I, what can I turn this stuff into? And I began to dabble a little bit with making video and quite fancied the idea of being creative in that area. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky I got into a practical media studies course and the one at Ulster was one of the few in the country at the time in the university sector. And uh, I just um, tried my hand at that. But I, I realised I wasn't good enough to be a director. Um, you know, you've been, a, a director is a very particular kind of skill. I wasn't bad at assembling images in the way that I assembled sounds, but I discovered something else that uh, um, I was a bit stronger at and had a greater enthusiasm for the ideas involved. Mm -hmm. And then that set me on the course to being the person who's sitting here in front of you. All right. <laughs> for good or for all. So yeah. you, you studied for your PhD at University of Ulster. Mm -hmm. um, and then was it... Were you the kind of first... Was that course, that, that PhD, the first of its kind in uh, Ulster? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I think... I mean, I had this... Um, I uh, once I graduated, I went and travelled around India for a bit. I'd saved up enough wow. money. Travelled around India for about four months, and you know went out there very fit and came back three stone lighter. Oh. Got dysentery and absolutely everything. I mean, wow. Still, wouldn't change it for the world. I uh -huh. mean, it was a utterly remarkable experience. Um, and then I came back to. Uh, a kind of rather grey Northern Ireland and thought, what am I going to do with myself? And right. I had, um, I managed hotel bars and did stuff like that. And uh, and then I thought, right, this is this is going nowhere. Um, and, but I should say this to everybody listening because uh, in case, they, you know, they're younger. I mean, it was the days before minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So I was managing a hotel bar for the pricely sum. As a graduate, they paid me a bit extra. So I was... Managing a hotel bar for the pricely sum of two pounds an hour. Wow. Uh, and nearly time and a half for overtime. And that's 1992. Not really that long ago. All right. And you think two quid an hour compared to what the minimum wage is now relative yeah. to inflation. So I thought, I'm in dead endsville. Mm -hmm. um, because it was, I mean, it's odd class wise. I mean, I'm sort of brought up very much a kind of in a working class environment. Um, no silver spoons or anything like that, but but because it was Port Ballantrae, this little seaside town, it 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 didn't. We weren't living in a housing estate, you mm. know. But we, the housing stock was different, you know. You had a kind of detached house and a yeah. bit of ground around it, but it was no, by no means a nice kind of middle class bungalow or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought, what am I going to do? I was the first in my family to get a university, and um, I thought, right, right, PhD perhaps. And someone had suggested, no, why don't you um, write a culture, a, a social history of Irish rock and pop for your, your PhD? It hasn't been done. And I thought, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this sounds good. That's where I'm so, getting it from. So I went into that. But what I, I found that you know, I, I was over ambitious. I, I wasn't ready or 
experienced enough to, mm-hmm. to write something as grand as a social history of Irish rock and pop. It was more like a cultural study of aspects of Irish rock and pop. It was a, a, a less ambitious thing. But I wasn't a natural even at starting that. Mm-hmm. It took me a long, long, long time to... I think I procrastinated writing. And I could so easily not have finished it. Mm. Um, and eventually you sort of you find your groove, and I kind of found my groove a little bit late, but I still did it. I um, got, my, got my PhD, and on the very day I handed it in, the next day I was starting at Northumbria University. Oh, wow, that quick? Yeah, so I was here in... Um, uh, the autumn of 1997. Right. And uh, PhD was handed in the day oh, before. Oh, wow. The day before. So there's kind of no hanging about there then. You're no. straight in, yeah. That's excellent. Um, so you moved Well, to- it's not like how you would plan. I mean, yeah. I mean, as I think my life would read like a manual how not to do your career. Right. <laughs> which, uh, which sometimes isn't that bad, you know, because um, like we've talked before off camera, it's like. You know, you can plan and plan, uh, procrastinate for years, years Mm -hmm. and years and years. And it's like, like I say at the start of these interviews, let's get into it, just get into it, just like Mm -hmm. next saying, just do it. Mm -hmm. But it's like you can kind of mess up with all the thinking and the pondering and the I should have done this and I should have done that. And um, analysts, analysts, Paralysis? Analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. And it's like, I'm really scared of that myself, you know, so I can kind of see where you're going there and it's it's absolutely great that you come straight, yeah. So you come to to Newcastle Mm -hmm. teaching at Northumbria University Mm -hmm. uh, and it was media production, but uh, cultural studies with media production. Yeah, it was. Uh, I yeah. think I was employed to um, um, to teach a mixture of sort of film studies yeah. and, and cultural studies um, to mainly practice students. Mm-hmm. And in those days, as I think of the legacy of the Polytechnic, they wanted the the kind of critical studies part of it to be delivered in house and not by existing more academic film studies. That mm-hmm. be, you'd somehow sort of bridge the gap. Mm-hmm. And it was a challenge learning to do that quite right. quickly because um, I, I remember getting off the plane and and uh, uh, I didn't know anywhere else to go. I didn't even have, even have accommodation sorted out. Oh, I right. so I'd had to trust that the university had set that up for me and uh, they said they said they would and they did. Um, but I remember um, being met by the programme leader and, and taking me for a coffee and he said, right, we're having a bit of a coffee and relax here. He says, um, I don't want to alarm you but you you have a first year class um, that you'll be lecturing in two hours time. Oh no! And I went, uh, uh, okay. Um, would you mind um, telling me what you screened for them? Oh, it was one of the videos in the list of stuff that you suggested. And I went, okay. Uh, which one? I had to go and get his diary out, and then went, oh, wow. um, uh, John Ford's The Searchers. Oh, yeah. And I went, right, OK. Um, I think I saw that film about ten years before for the last time and um, had been... Luckily, I'd been lectured on it by a very eloquent and uh, gifted academic and I had to sort of go away for an hour and sit down. It was the days before I could just go and Google aspects of the searches. There was no... Yeah. You couldn't even go to a Wikipedia page in those days and there were no smartphones. So I, I had to kind of go in and talk off the top of my head for two hours. Oh, wow. And I was um, a person who was very used to having to prep up and write things out longhand. I mean, I wasn't, again, a natural at going in and speaking. Mm -hmm. That would kind of come later. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's actually quite good to be thrown into things. It's the old old adage about if you want to teach a child or a dog to swim, you just... Chuck it in. You chuck it in. And, and in a way, uh, it kills any procrastination. Mm-hmm. And, well, I mean, the good news in the story is I, I, I survived. I didn't, oh, yeah. I didn't dry up after 10 minutes. And, um, and the students seemed kind of, over the time, appreciative of me. And that, that, was, um, that was very, very important. Mm-hmm. But you're off in that journey thinking, I mean, I didn't know how long I was going to last at 
in this city I'd only been to once before for the interview. And I really liked what I saw of the place. It mm-hmm. really intrigued me um, when I came. And But I thought maybe I'll last a couple of years and mm-hmm. who knows what life brings. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then nearly 25 years still later, there. 25 years later, I'm still... Still here, but I'm more of a film studies yes. lecturer now than a, I am. Um, and that course that you did that I taught on is now called film and television production rather than <laughs> than just media production. But mm-hmm. I mean, I was, I was. I, just, I mean, I'm talking too long. Cliff, please stop. Me. No, but, of, of but, course but, not. But, but the mad thing was that if you think about it, okay, I've just finished a PhD, uh, um, and two things were, were three things I think were really important in the air. I didn't want to leave Northern Ireland. Mm. And the first was that there'd been, a, there'd been a paramilitary ceasefire and there was the prospect of peace. And, you know, the Good, the Good Friday Agreement hadn't been signed, but it was, it was coming down the conveyor belt, I thought, typical. I've lived all my life with Northern Ireland and the Troubles, which we never thought we'd see the end of. Mm-hmm. And then I'm having to move just as Northern Ireland's at peace. <laughs> and the second thing, of course, was that it's new labour coming to power mm-hmm. and what that would mean positively for life in Northern Ireland. And then the third thing was I was uh, alongside my PhD, I started to DJ and um, I was running a a very novel club night in um, in the University of Ulster. Uh, it was called Shabash. Shabash, yeah. And... I mean, God, we were no David Holmes, myself and my fellow DJ, in terms of our mixing talents, but we we, we kind of taught ourselves. Mm-hmm. But we were playing stuff, that, um, even a lot of our contemporaries at that time, like David Holmes, would acknowledge no one else was really doing. So we were playing a lot of British-Asian crossover stuff, like um, Asian Dub Foundation and a lot yeah. of stuff from Nation Records and Black Star Liner and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and people like that. And a lot of... And, dope. Dub stuff as well. A lot of dub, yeah. and then Breakbeat was pretty new at the time with Skint Records and Wall of Sound Records, and this just this stuff just blew the cobwebs away. It mm-hmm. sounded, it sounded so fresh, mm. and it wasn't as hard as full on rave. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you, you didn't kind of need to be eat up for it to sound amazing. Because mm-hmm. I always remember a lot of my friends were very heavily involved in rave and, and making music, and then. Then they started getting into, into new jazz and mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff and broken beat. And I said, what what prompted the move mm. into all of this? A great mate of ours, Mike Bandoni, who you know recorded for Nine Bar Records and he was connected to the whole Ninja Tune thing and mm-hmm. all that. And he just said, well, it was just once you stop taking the ease, the music sounded really really bad. You know? <laughs> so you need so the musicality then begins to kind of creep in. And mm-hmm. I love dirty old. Hammer and rave. I mean, mm-hmm. but it, like like music, you know, you know, it's it's all about time and place, isn't it? It's yes, all about it context and circumstances and um, all of that. And um, yeah, so we got into this stuff, and we we we, we never thought it was going to really get an audience. Uh-huh. We were just just thought we were playing this because we like it. And yeah, yeah. The management of the students' union let us run with it, and then it became quite successful. Mm-hmm. And all that was going on. And I thought, right, the next plan was to maybe take it to Belfast and take it to the capital, Mm -hmm. see if it works there. Um, And I never got the chance to even test that out. Um, Then I've got the job here. Mm. And uh, and then I left DJing behind for Mm -hmm. years and years because I was just learning learning the job. Right, right. Sorry, You've, Cliff. I'm just, no, no, uh, it's, it's it's no, no. It's good. Talk, it's good. talking way too much. It's it's <laughs> absolutely fine. It's great. Uh, that's why we're here, you know. Um, you kind of jogged a memory about tapes because uh, that's kind of the tail end of tapes. But I still had tapes, and like a lot of people my age and a lot of my friends have still got tapes. And uh, you've jogged a memory talking about tapes because. Um, we used to organise, like, a party in the house, like, after school and the weekend and it was someone's birthday or it was New Year's Eve. And uh, at school, I used to kind of... I wouldn't say I was a, an events organiser, Mr Popular, at school, mm-hmm. but I used to organise these little house par- parties and then my friends would come and then we'd get other people to come and then we'd get the half of the class to come and... Anyway, long story short, um, I was late for the party that I kind of organised and um, 
and I, obviously I had tapes uh, on uh, on us and to play when you mm. get there. And I knocked at the door and I was like, must must have the wrong house. It's like it seems like there's no uh, there's nobody in. It's like knocking on the door. And then my friend came to the door and he was like, get in. Like, we're waiting for you for the tips. <laughs> and, like, so I came. <laughs> and I remember what I had. It was, um, oh, what the hell was it? It was, um, it wasn't like a deep heat, but it was something of mm-hmm. that ilk, you know. And, uh, and I remember the tunes I put on first was uh, a Damsky. Uh-huh. Uh, so I put that on and then the, just, the party just kind of, like, erupted with these, like, tips, you know. But uh, you've kind of just jolted a, a memory at the back at the back uh, of my mind there. I mean, I I, I kind of missed the compilation. Too. Yeah, just because you had to really think about what you were going to put on it, mm-hmm. and you had to do it in real time. Yeah, and if you know if it wasn't the right sequence, you just had to go back and start again. And yeah, stop isn't, that rewind it. Yeah. yeah, there isn't the same romance with a um, a Spotify playlist, or mm. it's you know it's mm-hmm. great. I mean, having all. So much music available. Have you said at your hand, doesn't it? I mean, it? I'm of that era where music was scarce. You know, you had to really think about what you were going to buy. Mm-hmm. I mean, my thing was that would I'd save my dinner money up. Mm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't use my dinner money to at school to buy dinner. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd 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 go and buy records. Buy music. And then and then when you only had X amount of money, you were very you're very choosy then about what you bought. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you're beginning to realise when you get a wee bit older that what you're buying's kind of starting to say something about your tastes to other people and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh um but records always had that kind of magic i was always looking yeah. for something that i could i could play again and again and not get tired of yeah of course uh, and that you'd discover more and more things in it and, yeah yeah um uh and, and it's, it's it's different now i think you've got all you know all music sort of kind of there mm-hmm. you know so you've got a apple music or spotify or whatever the platform mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you make playlists, but it changes your relationship to music and ways we could talk about for hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know there's no rewinding of the clock and we can't go back to that more innocent time. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's why I like records, because, you know, you put the record player on and then, you know, it's not going to get interrupted by messages pinging in if you're playing music off your iPad. Yeah. Um, and it just, to me, sounds better. It's a mm-hmm. very simple experience. Take the record out, give it maybe a bit of a wipe, stick it on. And yeah. Sounds, sounds wonderful. And were, were you, uh, did you come to Newcastle when uh, Hitsville was here, the record store? No, I don't remember Hitsville. You don't remember no, it, yeah. Um, no. it, it, it must have closed when you, when you came. I just thought, thought I would ask, because um, that was quite a big mm-hmm. re- uh, record store in the centre of Newcastle. I remember uh, RPM when was RPM, when it was yeah. it was in Percy Street, and that's actually still yeah uh, RPM. It, absolutely, I mean I and I still I don't buy anything like as many records off them as I used to, but mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that was the first record shop I've, I ventured into when I um, when I moved here. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't. I, I mean, I, I brought my turntables and stuff over with me, but they were just sort of they just sat in the place I lived, and yeah. they didn't really have a working life. Yeah. Um, I mean, DJing would come back into the story mm-hmm. kind of a bit later on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That would, uh, it would bounce back in. <laughs> um, so you're teaching at Northumbria Uni- University, and that's, for the people who don't know, that's when me and Noel met. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I always remember, I actually forgot to bring a, co- a couple of things down uh, just to show in, in the background, which one of the films was Diva. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you and you lectured on on that uh, French New Wave mm-hmm. films like White Telephone. Oh, that was movies. that was more the um, the precursors, the, the, the form of Italian cinema prior to Italian right. neorealism. Right. No, I mean Diva. I'm trying to remember the context within which. I mean, I bought the soundtrack to yeah. that album recently because it's it's so so good. But it, it was odd. I mean, at first I would try to thematize the, yeah. the, the the modules that. And then after a while, you realise that's not what um, a production student needs. They just Mm. need to see a diverse range of different films that the marketplace might not afford them the chance to see so easily. Yeah. And then also maybe look at films that one does know, but then see what kind of critical approaches to them can pull out. Mm. But, I mean, even if you've got, 72 screenings and 72 lectures across three years. I think that's what it was. Yeah. 
it's all it's something that you should have shown <laughs> with mm. hindsight uh, is always going to get left out. Um, it's something my colleagues now in film studies still talk about. They go, I mean, God, imagine our students have got through three years of film and TV studies, but we've never shown them X, you know, yeah. and, and I don't know how you get around that. You can't but, show them all, can you? It's like... No. It's... Well, why I brought that film up is because um, it's always stuck with me. me. Me and the twins were sitting in uh, the lecture. Obviously, we sat there, we watched the film. Um, you, do, you do your intro and uh, all the history of the film and... I kind of didn't know what was going on with, with the film halfway through. Then I think towards the middle I was starting to get it. And then, but anyway, uh, towards the end of the film, the, the film, the lights came on. And I, I don't know if you were just, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what was going through your head that day, but um, you kind of stormed up in front of the um, the screen and you, went, and you went, if anyone in this class doesn't appreciate the cinematography in that film. Get out this class <laughs> right now. <laughs> did, did, I, did I put it so bluntly as well? Click yeah. Oh no. But no. it was it was absolutely mm. brilliant. No. It was like we're all just stuck to a chair. Just I think it was really early on in the course as well. And well, I was just thinking, yeah. shit. This I mean, it's lucky. I mean, I, I, I'm nostalgic for those days because you guys had a dedicated screening room. Yeah. And we just took that for granted. And it was a, it had a blacked out ceiling and it was basically a black box. That was brilliant. And it had yeah. a very good quality projection system. Yeah. And now, um, you know, the rooms in Northumbria are all standardised. So mm. Standard digital projector. Mm. And, okay, some of the rooms have a Blu-ray player. But I've never um, seen stuff projected as well in a mm. higher educational setting as that, as that room. Uh, I, I think uh, another, I remember another year I sat in and I watched, we had a very good SD version of, or HD equivalent version of Paris, Texas. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in with the students and it just looked absolutely magnificent right. on, on widescreen. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, that's what we're there to do. I, I mean, I just love great cinematography. Oh yeah, of course. Um, and uh, oh, uh, I mean, it was so great to hear. No, you know, it was it was really. <laughs> I feel, uh, I feel embarrassed. I <laughs> think <laughs> I think some of the other guys who I wouldn't say we didn't get on with as much, but there was a there was a couple of people you're not going to get on with everyone on your course and in, your, mm. in your class. You know, I think the realizing the realization hit with some of them, and they just kind of. Just mm. starting to sink in the seat and thinking, I think I think I may be on the wrong course, mm -hmm. and I think it was a benchmark. I think you hit a, a benchmark there because me and the twins, uh, Gab and Luca, if, you, if you're watching, we after the class we were just like, yeah, this is going to be so cool this course, but I, I think that the flip side of that is people dropped out, mm -hmm. but not because of what you said. I think. Maybe it was just not for them. And, you know, I've thought about a lot of things that you said on, on that course. Um, obviously, I'll not go into them all now, but I remember um, you gave us a bit of advice on when I was making my short film. Is a, You went, Cliff, I don't have anyone on the set who doesn't do anything. Always have someone who does something. And mm -hmm. I, I've, I still have that now. Mm -hmm. um, because what you get is is people just hanging around, just watching you, yeah. who maybe don't know what they're doing. And then when they see you pondering and looking about and like, how, how am I going to frame this? How am I going to do this? They start giving you bits of advice and just think, you know what it is? Mm -hmm. I wish you hadn't a game, you know? And it's, I kind of took that on uh, advice on board, you know? That, that advice actually came um, from Ken Loach. Oh, wow. Um, because... Well, it didn't come directly initially from Ken Loach to me, but it came from Emer McCourt, who played um, Susan in, uh, I think, a film I screened back in those days, Riff Raff. Riff Raff, on, yeah. On the building site, and she yeah. played the, the, the kind of the junky girlfriend with aspirations to become a star. Yeah. Um, but she, she visited Northumbria, and I think Emer now lives in Newcastle, but it was before she'd moved to Newcastle. And she came in and she'd very kindly did some work with the students. And this would be 1998, be 1999. Mm -hmm. And she went out to set to watch some students filming. And the students had this kind of quite intimate scene to film between a, you know, nothing sexual. It was just a girl and boy talking in bed. Mm. Um, and she just clocked all the folk hanging around and um, said, look, here's an experiment for you. 
get everybody out of the room that's not required to be there yeah and then try and do the scene again and then we watched it in action and the difference for you know the young amateur actors Mm -hmm. but the difference also for the director then beginning to get a feel for what was actually going on Mm -hmm. because when the hardest thing i think when you're making a a shoot on a low budget is that you you don't have the luxury of hierarchy you can't order folk around you can't you can't turn up in the set fresh and just think about creative ideas. You're lugging in a generator, you're lugging in lights like everybody else is, mm-hmm. and that's how it should be. Mm-hmm. But then how do you create the same intimacy where you're focusing on the thing itself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was the... It was those sort of little aspects of engaging with mm-hmm. things that... I'm glad, I'm glad you remember aspects of things like that because... You know, critical ideas play their role in, yeah, in, ma- in making things. Oh, yeah, and definitely. And I think the really good students got that. Not only got it, they went on and made a career out of it and are mm-hmm. still working in in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really, really pleased about that. And often some of the the folk that came into the course as wild cards, they didn't have the orthodox qualifications, mm. uh, didn't have the points that were required, but had different kinds of experience. And sometimes yeah. those wild card folk went on to become some of the most conventionally successful mm-hmm. students on the program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I remember so much from the the course. It's just you know, it was a brilliant course. Uh, hand, hands up in the class who wants to be a, di- a, a director. <laughs> Everyone puts their hands up except me and the twins. We didn't. Yeah, and a couple, a couple more, but. I'd say ninety percent of that class, but you knew that everyone was going to put their hand up. Who mm. wants to be a director? Mm. And it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of not what the course was about, you know. Um, but to ta- to tail off on that, um, I once arrived to one of your lectures um, er- uh, early, which I used to do quite a lot. Um, I think I was just so keen, so keen mm. to learn, and so keen to learn what these guys uh, are here are here to teach you, you know. Um, and you went, oh, Cliff, you, you about, you know, you about half hour early. Um, go home and uh, listen to your latest Ultravox album or something. <laughs> it's always stuck in my head. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, Ultravox. Like, yeah, but, yeah, why did <laughs> walking it, away. Yeah, you know, I think I, I, I think that was my vain attempt at, at kind of trying to be surreal. Yeah. Y- you know. <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, uh, and a big shout out to uh, Mike Gallen as well who oh, was, of course uh, Absolutely. Uh, obviously uh, retired um, and Robert Jefferson mm-hmm. who's I think he's actually going to come on Rob oh I, gotta, I hope he does I hope yeah, he does he's, uh, um, he's, he's kind of uh, agreed to come on yeah so it's going to be an, it's going to be absolutely great ch- chatting to Rob you know um, oh I mean he's a he's a wonderful filmmaker yeah and uh, another great individual at inspiring He's good at expiring students, and I mean, I love the way that towards the sort of the end of media production, as then was before it became film and TV production, the animation wing of it was basically sort of an experimental film strand. Yeah. It was any diversity of means that wasn't just straightforward live action filmmaking, mm-hmm. and so it wasn't just restricted to animation, mm-hmm. and that began to produce really, really interesting work that kind of fed into all sorts of things and all sorts of directions. Um, and that was Robert and the late Peter Leake that really Peter allowed Leake, it to go. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the only folk that are left in film and TV production from our era, as it were, are um, it's really Robert and uh, another individual, Ian Cottage. And, Ian Cottage, yeah. And everyone else is retired or... Uh, I actually forgot to mention uh, Brian Hoey. Uh-huh. I was, also retired. Yeah, also retired, and uh, I mean, it's a it's a different kind. I think it's a different kind of higher education. Now. Mm. Um, I mean, when I uh, moved to London, I became I had a friend who had um, spent a year at New York University's film school. You know, the alma mater of folk like Martin Scorsese and mm. all that stuff. And uh, he said to me, um, no, also, you taught media production at Newcastle, Newcastle and Northumbria. So, yeah. Well, what was, what was the biggest complaint that the students would have about a production course in the university sector in the UK? He said, well, that 
you know, one's fees, etc. weren't going into master classes and practical how tos and, you know, you know, guest cinematographers and guest lighting camera operators and all of that, mm. guest editors. And um, he paused and said, "Yeah, that was what uh, all the students at NYU would moan about." Wow. And if you think of the economies of scale, I think the fees then were like for NYU were thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. This is before, you I mean, Lord knows what it would be now. That wasn't even buying enough to satisfy the students' expectations. Mm-hmm. So how do you do it in higher education? Mm. Um, it's very difficult because I think some students expect that they're coming on to a film school. Yeah. And film schools are elitist organisations, and you know, um, driven by private patronage and all of that. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to expect and to try and meet those expectations. Mm-hmm of what you can do in a course. Mm-hmm. And the strongest bit of it's really the the critical ideas aspect of it, I think, if you can ignite students' imaginations. Um, that's more important than the how-to stuff. In fact, one of the brilliant things that Peter Leake devised, because he spent, he was there from the founding of the course in 86, and he noticed that he just to try to keep up with all the technology. Yeah. And he couldn't keep up with it. Yeah. And then he discovered that the students were just intuitively starting to learn it more quickly. So he developed the course would work in a way where it would have an informal apprenticeship system built into it. Mm -hmm. So folk were always passing on what they learned about, say, avids were new in those, relatively new in those days. And um, and then the real value you can give the students is not trying to show them the nuts and bolts of avid, it's when you cut yeah. It's what good editing is. Mm-hmm. And that's where the teaching should come in, mm-hmm. not the, the how-to stuff. Because you'll learn that stuff more quickly in the industry if you're going to work in the industry anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's all about how you design something and mm-hmm. how that works. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you worked with, I, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, Chemo. Perkio. Kimo Perkio. Yeah. yeah. The genius so, that is Kimo Perkio. Yeah. Uh, and he actually was a student at Northumbria. Uh-huh. Uh, and he graduated. I mean, I don't know the guy, um, but he graduated in animation. So Robert Jefferson should know who he is as well. Yeah, though Robert wasn't teaching in the course at that point. Oh, in was time. he not? No. Um, but Kimo was, um, again, one of those folk who worked in animation, but it wasn't traditional animation. It was very much a an amalgamation of stop motion work, you know, most yeah. famously like Schwankmeyer's work and mm-hmm. um, gifted with soft, uh, stop motion. But he also would go in and learn sort of new programs and mm-hmm. he became a whiz with this thing called Elastic Reality. And he, it was sort of like a, an early morphing software, but he wouldn't use it just to, to morph. He'd use the morphing as a way of, um, he'd use it in a kind of musical way. Um, to either for edit transitions or wow. to kind of work alongside a soundtrack drone or something. Mm. So say the oh, this doesn't sound too technical. Like if you see you're opening the the, the envelope up of a, a synthesizer sound, you know, he would get the elastic reality to match the waveform. Right, and he had these kind of skills, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, he came from a sort of music background, yeah, music I production that. background first, but. Um, yeah, he was he was exactly the same age as me. So mm-hmm. I was about 30, 31. And, and I had friends in Belfast that I DJed with. And, um, and they'd formed a, a, an electro duo. Mm-hmm. They, um, they'd initially called themselves Geiger. And then they, they opted for basic after the, the computer language. And they would go around Northern Ireland playing with their sort of keyboards and computer bits and bobs anywhere a DJ could go. So they could just plug into the sound system and play that way. Like right. like, like a kind of DIY orbital, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, rambling a bit about this. Um, they get signed to this record label called Kitchen Recordings. Yeah, Kitchen Recordings. And, um, they, I mean, Kitchen Recordings, named after the Kitchen Nightclub in, in Dublin City. Yeah. In the basement of the Clarence Hotel. And, and and if you know about that hotel, it's owned by none other than kind of Bono and the Edge of U2. And this was their dance music label. And it was run by Bono's uh, childhood friend, uh, Reggie. And they signed Basic after 
they're receiving thousands of demos, dance music demos. And then they wanted, uh, um, they talked about a music video. So Kimmo and I went away and made it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you just off our own bat, and they did this wonderful track called Greenback. Um, and we uh, did the video, and that one thing led to it. And it had lots of that elastic reality in the cutting. Mm-hmm. And we went over to Dublin, met up with Reggie, and we had no expectations. We showed it to him, and he went absolutely berserk and said, this is just stunning, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then it had a life on MTV, and uh, mm-hmm. Zane Lowe was a presenter, primetime presenter on MTV in those days, and he even did a free feature on the, the music yeah. video. And then the next thing we're being... <laughs> we're approached by The Edge. Oh, and, wow. And he's saying, um, would you put a sort of like showreel thing together and send it to our offices. And I said, um, yeah, sure, but mm-hmm. wh- wh- why? And he went, well, why do you, why might you think? And, well, you, are you um, kind of thinking we could kind of make a video for you folks? And he said, that's exactly why I'm asking you to do it. And um, I'm glad it came to nothing. In the end, yeah, so yeah, it was interesting um, to read that because it, yeah. it goes back to how you started playing music. You you mm. didn't you weren't interested in playing live or doing it, being famous. You just loved mm. playing music. But yeah. and then fast forward to, you know, making tunes for potentially uh, Bono and Edge and all mm. the rest of it. So it's like, what was what was that conversation? What was going through your head? I, I know you've said, well, why and but mm. why. Why are you pleased it didn't really happen? Well, I, I mean, I, I would have been very pleased it happened for, for Kimo. Um, yeah. Because that would have been a, a huge opportunity for him. And I think mm-hmm. if, it, if it had have happened, I would have, I think I'd have actually just stepped back and let him kind of go and do it with the budget. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really interested in the pressure. Uh, I mean, it's enough fun for me just to be able to tell the story, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't want... To, to get in, I mean, I was, I, I realised that, um, I don't know, there's something about when the pressure kicks in that something then doesn't really become as interesting. Mm-hmm. And I had no ambitions to be a, a music video director whatsoever uh, for, you know, and sure, you get curio- curious about being on set and working with folk who are international celebrities. Mm-hmm. But... Um, it's it's not a a world. I mean, for a few years, you know, I could I could sort of go and stay in the Clarence Hotel from doing that work, and I, you know, and it wasn't quite for free, but it would always be for sort of like strange amounts of money. Like, um, I remember my girlfriend and I at the time going over and staying in the Clarence Hotel, and it was like twenty three pounds and fifteen pence for the night mm. in this sort of five star deluxe, and you're mm-hmm. thinking. Twenty three pounds and fifteen p. Where did they get that from? Yeah, and I don't know what way that worked, but you know, yeah, you get into that world, and I, th- I mean, it's it was lovely one evening meeting kind of in- Eno and Lanwa, and having them saying nice things about your music video. Yeah, I mean, I mean, now that th- there's a there's a you know, I, I, I mean, you, you you do kind of that evening feel slightly high. Yeah, you've got that, to be impressed that with that folk you've admired um, actually like something that you've done. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can't really put a price on that. No. And, um, but then I, I, you, it's odd. Um, you get a little starstruck, and when you're a little starstruck, you don't kind of really know what to say. Mm. I mean, I'm, I think the first time I ever met a fully, fully fledged hero was uh, the folk who nearly we didn't sign with. Um, they had Debbie Harry on their roster, uh, and in 1990, I think 91, I can't remember. So I got the opportunity to hang around with Debbie Harry when she was playing Belfast right. and even sat next to her in a minibus. And, and the, the real tragedy of it is it's like one of those people, you know, that likes reading books but can't talk about what they've read. So you go, what, what did you think of that? <laughs> oh, it's a brilliant book. And so wh- what did you think of it? Um, it's a brilliant book. Yeah. And so if it's, what, so Debbie Harry, what was she? Like? I don't know. I, just, I was too scared to say anything. I didn't know mm. to... You know, to, you know, what to ask her? Um, right. And I, I just was incredibly tongue-tied. That happens, uh, and, you know. And she was very, very sort of reserved speech-wise as well. You know, you could sort of see that she 
kind of conserved her energy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to be, I was incredibly starstruck because I'm just used to sort of staring at these incredible cheekbones. And, mm. and, uh, and I think Parallel Lines was the first album I bought that was something that you might regard as cool. Mm. You know, of course, I had records before that, but those are the records you didn't really want to admit to because those are your childhood records. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, and all of that. So that was quite, so meeting people, um, like that's always a bit strange because it's hard to put the power dynamic to one side. Yeah, I much prefer hanging around with creative people that you can sort of be more open with, and they can be more open in return. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a lot mm. more fun than having that awkward thing called fame and celebrity. Yeah, creating the kind of barriers it does uh, among people. What 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 you've just said there with uh, getting tongue tied, maybe starstruck, and with uh, Deborah Harry in the in the in the cab, it kind of reminds us of um, I had I've got this I think I've still got it an old VHS tape uh, I uh, I collect VHS tapes you see I've had them for absolute years but I think I've got quite a rare one called D Dynamite Chicken mm -hmm. and it's presented by Richard Pryor. Oh wow! And um. It's a real rare thing I've gotten. There's, it's just a video of uh, sketches, like off the wall, uh, like odd, ob obscure, like a sketch that didn't really make it to um, Saturday Night Live, or mm. was it Saturday Night Live? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you got these like sketch show after sketch show after sketch show, and you just and it's a bit of like nudity in there as well. Mm. It's a bit, it's a bit crude, some of it. But there's this one sketch that kind of reminds us of what you've just been saying, where a guy walks into what um, uh, a casting uh, call, the director sitting in the chair, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, we're looking for this guy. He's, he's um, yeah, a really heartbroken guy. Uh, um, he's lost his kids. He's." He's he's uh, divorced from his wife, blah, blah blah. Right? Can you can you be that guy? Yes, yes, I can. So the guy's uh, sitting there, and he's like, "Well, start one uh, whenever you want." Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm feeling really down. Um, just he's acting bad, you know. The director looks at him. He's like, "Nah, I, thanks for coming, but I don't think you're gonna cut it in this film." No, 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 please. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of wait, uh, wakes up when he mm. when he realises he can't get it. It's like, no, 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 please. Um, I've really got no money. I've been living on the streets for two weeks. Uh, please, I really need this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> and um, and it just goes on like, oh, for ages. Every time the guy says action, he just can't act. Mm. But when he says you can't do it, then the acting comes out, not acting the real the real him uh, came out. But it's kind of just reminded us of that. Uh, of that. That's 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 a. Uh that's a vital methodology though when it comes to comes to directing too yeah because that that takes us full circle back to ken loach again because yeah tra trying to create ways to get people to not be acting yeah because you get uh, you get sort of something very 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 different mm -hmm. i mean there was the day i think did i ever use it in your group and i mean it's a bit like by necessity i end up trying to inject a bit of humor into a lecture it doesn't always work <laughs> but but you forget which jokes you've told to which years often. Yeah. But, and then you forget which sort of stunts you've pulled. But mm. you, know, you try to explain that thing about improvisation. It's like, I mean, imagine I say you two all as a group and you're all being filmed that I'm going to do something really shocking and you're going to have to look surprised. So one, two, three, look surprised. Yeah. And then I, I, I go back into the lecture and then just mid-sentence I just yell at them. Right. There's this big howl. And then go, fuck's sake. I mean, I, I mean yeah. the, pro the problem is that you know, I probably couldn't do that in today's health and safety world. Yeah. What, if some, what if someone has a heart attack? Mm -hmm. But the, you're getting the sense that one is going to register on camera very, very, very differently mm -hmm. than the, than the mm -hmm. other one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's all of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I suppose my thing in life is just a, a kind of, you know, it's balancing sort of uh, shyness and awkwardness with yeah. having to deliver material and to talk and yeah. um that's a that's a that's a tricky one so yeah, yeah um so the kind of the video for for edge didn't didn't work out or how 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 did that come about to well, an that, end that, beca that became i think of one of those uh, don't call us call you mm -hmm. uh, i mean we, we didn't have enough of a showreel really to send them mm -hmm. because um I mean, we, we, we put another video together for a basic track called The Video Age, 
but we only really had two tracks on it. And I think Reggie even said to me, the label boss, I mean, it's just a shame you didn't have one other thing. Mm. But by that stage, fashions were changing quickly. Mm -hmm. Kitchen recordings, uh, I think Kitchen offered Basic a, um, an album deal. Um, they didn't, they rejected the album deal for their, right. own, you know, for their own reasons. And then that was the end of them and Kitchen. And then um, they signed to another label called Reverb, and we, we made another video for them. Right. Um, not as good, I don't think, as the as the first one. And um, and it didn't get the same life um, as the first one. So by that stage, things had sort of moved on. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, that you, was the... Yeah, yeah, and then uh, obviously still teaching at Northumbria University, but then you co-wrote a book with Martin McClune, Martin McClune yeah. Hybridity. Yeah, I mean, that, that came a bit sort of later. I mean, I think it was those early days I didn't... Northumbria was largely a teaching university mm -hmm. and research wasn't of the same importance mm -hmm. in terms of income and so on. I mean, research now is a major part of how higher education institutions mm. make their money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, universities now focus, function less, I guess, as universities than as corporations. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't the same pressure to do research. I would write the odd thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't a great deal of time to do that. I was catching up and learning, teaching and so on. And then I think around about 2000, I realised I didn't know anybody in Newcastle, hardly, apart from um, fellow staff, fellow colleagues who were friends and, and students, some students who were more my age and friends. And I began to feel quite like quite a claustrophobic sort of existence. Right. And, um, and it was only really through running events for the students post degree show thing because I was very shocked that after the degree show students just went to whatever house party or went to the pub or went wherever club there was oh, no after yeah. thing yeah so I think we probably did it in your day didn't we we all cut the work up and had a yeah had a night and I started doing that in 1998 and we, we did it in the um uh, in the riverside then went back then uh, upstairs and I thought that was a good, this was excitement about arriving in a new city. I thought, God, Newcastle's got lots of really interesting club spaces mm. and interesting, you know, and coming from a rural background and a campus university, I made the decision to live in the city centre. But through, I think, the last of those club nights, I got to meet um, and became friendly with local music producers and DJs, Frank Manseed, um, Smooth, and others. And, um, and I'm just delighted that those folk are my friends to this very, very day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wonderful, wonderful folk. And and that gave, I began to then develop a social life and interests outside of um, university. In fact, Frank would end up um, doing some work with Basic. Frank would end up rapping with Basic in the Kitchen Nightclub in Dublin oh, and staying wow. in the Clarence and Frank played Belfast on a couple of occasions and and you know you, you'd, I'd enjoy being involved in creative things sort of happening mm -hmm. in the city and um, that was really enjoyable and and then um, but I still wasn't doing any DJing and then mm -hmm. a bar called Popolo opened in 2002 mm -hmm. And then um, myself, Frank, Smooth, others, we'd end up DJing in this place. And it, and it, was, it was the changing in the licensing laws was happening in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. you, know, you remember it back in the old days, 11 o'clock, that was it. Yeah. And then you had to go to either somewhere like the Jazz Cafe if you wanted just to have another drink and pay in. Right. And that's if the late Keith Crombie let you in. Yeah. <laughs> and I think or, I, I got knocked back on there a few times. Well, it's, it was always quite arbitrary. And yeah. then you had the thing as well where you had, then you had to go and pay to get into a club. Mm -hmm. And then the licensing laws changed when you labour and Popolo was one of those bars that not only did cocktails and stayed open to one, mm -hmm. but it had DJs. Mm -hmm. and, but you could play all this music that was either before seen as too soundtracky, too chilled out, mm -hmm. 
too cheesy, not rock and roll enough. So you could play a lot of a lot of jazz and a lot of bossa jazz mm -hmm. and um, you know French language hip hop and uh, dub and reggae and broken beat and whatever. Uh, if it was any good and you could sort of stitch it together halfway well, and I thought this was really exciting. Yeah, you didn't have the pressure of having to keep people dancing. Mm -hmm. um, you could you could do a bit of that on weekend nights, but you could also, you know, just make a soundtrack for the evening. Some of the folk that were playing in the place were so good that you know, sometimes I'd just go out to hear some of the DJs mm -hmm. playing. But, but that was also, um, for want of a better word, keeping your hand in with your teaching because it was keeping your teaching relevant, plus mm -hmm. you were in on the scene, you, you knew what was coming in, what was coming out, and then you were kind of you know, going back to university and talking about all this stuff mm. that you're doing. So it's keeping you quite relevant within the context and the scene, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I don't think I had, I think that's a, a better reason than the one I would have given. Right. <laughs> uh, it's and a, and a grander sounding one, because I think it was really a way of having something else other than work. Mm -hmm. you know and having something that you look forward to outside of it because I mean I, I used to like going out in the city and but I preferred going out on a, a quiet weekday night mm. it was a bit of a shock to me as the kind of country bumpkin mm -hmm. I'd never seen uh, the great northeast kind of socialising of a weekend en masse you know everybody out in the streets at the same time for taxis yeah um, everybody kind of going into one place where the music was deafening yeah. and queuing to get there drinking up and going on to the next place and doing the same thing again. Yeah. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that. Yeah. And I couldn't really get into doing anything like that. So, of course, I mean, I'm nostalgic for my early days in the city because I didn't know what was what. Mm -hmm. So you just went and tried out different places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember kind of drinking in the Black Gar and all the pubs, like the, the clock and stuff. And how I survived it. There's me in a... I looked a different kind of extreme in those days. I had like <laughs> shaved hair and I always, always eyeliner. Right. Um, I don't know whether you noticed that when you was I was doing wearing the eyeliner back in the days I was teaching you guys and I, oh, you know, I and all that. And, uh, I think I noticed and that. looked a bit extreme for, mm -hmm. um, in my own kind of wee way. And somehow I never got beaten up. And it's one of the things I have to say to, to my, to, to Newcastle's credit. Mm hmm. Um, how many experiences have I had of anti-Irish racism in Tyneside in 25 years, nearly? Mm. One. Right. And that wasn't from someone from Newcastle. It was from a middle-class uh, student at Durham University oh. who referred to myself and my DJing friend Robert Braniff as a couple of paddies. And then when the, the big northeast bouncer from Popolo heard, heard that he'd said this. <laughs> we just saw the guy being thrown up the street. Wow. Says, I'm not having any of that anti-Irish stuff in here or any of that. And, I mean, that's quite an achievement for a city. It not is. one um, derogatory remark. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. I mean, that's... I can't say that about London. That says a lot <laughs> about uh, Newcastle, uh, doesn't it? You know what I mean? It's like London, on the other hand, is a completely different... You know, tucked all together, but you actually, it's got a little segue to London because you actually got married <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, yeah. you kind of didn't move to London, but you were living this dual yeah. London, Newcastle, but oh. you still taught at Northumbria. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious to how you, how did I do that? How did you do that? I did it for 10 years. 10 I mean, years. And, um, yeah, I, w I went to London in 2007. Um, love and marriage took me to London um, I was really happy in London for that decade I mean I mean, I, it's, it's an utterly remarkable city it's just a shame that it's become such an expensive city Yeah, and it's pricing a lot of young creative people out of it um, particularly in those areas that were once upon a time bohemian areas like Notting Hill and Ladbroke Grove area where I lived um, or Camden or wherever, I mean Brixton they're now gentrifying so mm. well Notting Hill is the, the house prices were just obscene yeah of course you know, and um, so once you know I was but I was basically commuting up and down every week when I'd teaching on mm -hmm. now you couldn't have done it if you were in a conventional 9 to 5 
Yeah. But um, I was able to do it for, for a while. And then I also had sabbaticals, and that's when... And see, 2007 was a, important for two reasons in my life, I guess. I got married and moved to London, but also I became part of film and TV studies. Yeah. And then I was... Then research was on the table. Mm-hmm. And that meant that research was being prioritised. And so, I, I started then to be able to really... You've got support mm-hmm. to start writing books. You've got reasons to be writing books. Mm-hmm. And then that's when the book you referred to... Um, uh, rock and popular music in Ireland before and after you two. Mm-hmm. Um, it came out in 2012. Mm-hmm. It took about four years to write, from about 2008 to 2012. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was a big sea change for me because yeah, I, I think I find if life's always about looking cliff, you know, into to find who you are yeah. and what you're into. Yeah. That was a, and it was more important for that reason. It's like, right, okay, that's really what I should be doing. I mean, there's that lovely phrase about uh, John Savage quotes from John Lennon, where an interviewer says to him, to the young Lennon, so what do you, how do you spend your day if you're not kind of in the studio? He said, well, I spend my day, most of my day, finding out what I think I should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> and, you can map that to your life. You know, you can spend a lot of your life trying to figure out what you should be doing. Uh-huh. And should I be DJing? You know, and I love DJing. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah, I absolutely loved it. And you know, I was very flattered that I started off what playing once a week for fun. Mm-hmm. And then by the time I'd moved to London, I was I was kind of grateful to stop DJing because I was playing five, six nights a week, mm-hmm. and that's great. But there's a moment where that stops being fun. Yeah. Sometimes I think the very best night you have as a DJ is when you don't think you're a DJ. It's the first night you play mm-hmm. and you just play a lot of good records that you mm-hmm. haven't heard out before mm-hmm. and you try and play them in the right in some kind of order. Mm-hmm. Then after that, you kind of then keep becoming the professional DJ. You're thinking about what you're going to be playing. Mm-hmm. And I just love listening to music now without ever having to think about what I'm going to be playing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and... Um, but yeah, I, I think writing is what I enjoy most and I feel is kind of most me. And yeah, I like, yeah. I like writing and researching. Uh, there's a real challenge in it because you start off and you just feel incredibly stupid. doesn't matter how many articles you've written or how decorated your books are, mm-hmm. but you start off and you feel really you, you feel really stupid because it takes a long, long time to see any clarity mm-hmm. um, in the research and building a story. And then once you get the rock pushed up a hill to a certain degree, then you can start to play with the material a bit mm-hmm. more and begin to work with it. And I like that bit probably most. Mm-hmm. But you certainly don't go into it thinking, hey, I'm really clever. Me. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the reverse. But there's a satisfaction in getting something finished as well as you can. Although I'm very pleased with the last book, but you know, it now goes off into the world to fend for itself and I'm not there to speak for it. Oh, and, yeah, it's and, like a little kid, you isn't said, it? You can't please everybody. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's worth doing for its own sake. It's just um, rock, and, rock and popular music in Ireland before and after you too uh, was regarded as definitive, I, I think. Mm. I think that's quite nice to, to read. Mm. And uh, Irish Embassy in London has an event in honour of, of the book. I mean, yeah, I mean those were those were remarkable things, Cliff. I mean, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, you don't set out to write. You, you, you're, so you set out to write something, hoping that you'll you'll do a good job. You're you're never really ultimately sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, I'm glad it did well for the university, and it did well in what they call the research evaluation framework, and because all that work scored and. It affects Northumbria's place in the league table. Yeah. And Northumbria's place in the league table shapes how many students we get, what income we get. and It's all now about universities competing with one another. Right. I wish it wasn't like yeah. that. But that's the world we're in. So if you if you play a small part in keeping that world going mm-hmm. and you, you, you live another day like to, to write another book, mm-hmm. yeah. to keep your research entitlement alive, that's a big game to play for. But if... The, the biggest thing, though, is if the work feeds out into the broader culture and folk find 
value in the book and it was it was very well received and um then that's pressure for the next time. Can, yeah. Can can you do that? Can again? you top that? Yeah. Yeah, but I suppose the as a as an as a as an Irish person in, who's lived in England now for a quarter of a century, it, it is quite something to be invited by uh, the amb- the Irish ambassador for the UK to um, go to Belgravia and mm-hmm. be entertained and speak about your book and you know. You know, meet members of the undertones and all of that. Oh, it's brilliant! And, you know, it? so you have a bit of there's a bit of yeah uh, pride in that. Of course, you know. of course, it is. Um, yeah. But um, mm, you know, I, I suppose <laughs> I, 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 I'm just not, I'm I, it's I'm not a natural. Uh, um, I wouldn't be very good in one of those sort of Richard and Judy book launch things, you yeah. know, about book promotion shows because yeah. I, I, you know. It's easier to talk about when it's the ideas, and then yeah. than it is the 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 the, the, the kind of um, uh, the accolades. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just pleased that uh, I suppose someone that I say this to students. It wasn't easy for me to find my place here. It didn't happen by magic. Mm. You know, I'm not some person who was destined to lecture in a university. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have this impos- imposter syndrome as much as anyone else where someone's right. going to come up and tap me in the shoulder and say, well, Rumble, you, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just pleased to have found my place through... Because, yeah. uh, you know, I often wonder, what could I have coped with? What else could I have coped with? What, mm-hmm. else, what might, else might I be good, reasonably good at? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's you just feel pleased from a, an individual personal perspective mm-hmm. that you've survive to get into something that Cross. you you can function in and and, mm-hmm. and survive in well it's like um like it just said that i mean you're on a journey like we're all on a journey now and 10 20 years time you don't know what you're going to be doing it's like um but every step like um dr martin luther king it's like mm-hmm. um if you can't see the whole staircase just take the first step and then when you get there, you'll maybe see where you're going. So you have to take that first step. I'm not saying you're taking first steps, yeah. but in the grand scale of the world and your mind, the, those first couple of steps could be your music, your university, mm-hmm. your books. Who mm-hmm. knows what's, who knows what you're going to do? You know what I mean? Well, my dad, who's the gentlest soul in the world and the most encouraging human being, I mean, he would... You know, if, if it was in his power to do something for someone that would help them, he, 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 mm-hmm. he not only would do it, he's done it consistently. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he'd always tell the story when I was, you know, uh, to people. Well, Noel was talking early but walking late, and I think that sort of becomes a metaphor for me. Wow! You know, nice. um, I think my ability to express things was ahead of my mm-hmm. <laughs> my ability to realise them yeah. sometimes. And. So I, I, I'm always, in a way, sort of playing a bit of catch up with mm-hmm. myself. Um, it took me, you know, pretty much into my late thirties to find my voice as a writer. I mean, I wrote, wrote stuff before then, mm-hmm. but I was fumbling around. I was second, trying to second guess other people, trying to second guess what was good. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I think everything from that era was particularly bad, mm-hmm. but maybe this is one of the, I think one of the things about growing older is you realise how stupid we all are, really. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, wisdom resides in knowing that life can make fools of us some of the time, mm-hmm. and it takes some of the self consciousness out of you. You know, you're mu- I'm much a lot less anxious about being cool or any of that mm-hmm. sort of stuff, and there's a freedom that goes with that where you, you, you feel then you can. It's too late now. I'm going to write. I'm going to see what my voice in this is actually like rather than me trying to second guess and be like another writer that I admire. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just figure out, try and figure out, if it doesn't sound too pretentious, what your own voice is and trust yeah. that. And then the thing itself becomes a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, of course. You, know? and you can do that with DJing or anything. You can try to be... You know, uh, uh, I mean, I I always would watch other people in awe. I mean, I was always I thought I knew post punk electronica. Then you you spend a night DJing with Mick Clark, and, mm. and um, 
then you, you realize that you've you've been sort of paddling in the shores you know mm-hmm. or um if you think you're sort of good reason you get reasonably good technically then you look at you know someone like sort of mike bandone or mm-hmm. and then um then if you think that you've you've got a, an ample collection that that's explored enough stuff you know then you kind of you look at sort of smooth's record collection or and you're again you're kind of dabbling a bit all right and then you just have to find well what what do i like doing mm-hmm. it's for good or for ill it's the way that i do it but mm-hmm. um i mean i enjoyed i loved playing in newcastle because you had to work an awful awful lot harder right. than when i dj'd in london and i and I, and when i dj started djing in london about 2011 um in this phenomenal little pub in notting hill called the, the Kai. i mean <laughs> um you didn't have to work as hard. You could play. You could, you could sort of play a, a version of a good wedding disco. Mm. Um, and you weren't in a booth. So you, no, you no. Were, you were just, you were you were just, the just on the bar. Yeah, you were just at the bar. People would come and talk to you. That was great. I mm-hmm. loved that. Um, often, folk didn't even know you were DJing. There was a, there was right. a DJ. But you, I mean, that's the only place I think I've ever played in where I had abs- one night. I had absolutely everybody dancing. Wow. And they were all dancing in the furniture, and they were dancing in the furniture outside, and uh, and of course. Typical DJ neurosis. I couldn't really enjoy the moment because so you, you don't seem to be enjoying the fact that everybody inside's doing all this. And yeah. I said, "Well, because the only way is down." Yeah. You know, yeah. How how do you keep that going? Mm. Um, but it, that was fun because I didn't. It wasn't the same sort of labour involved in having to dig out obscurities and having to stay on trend with. You know, it was more. Is it fun? Is it eclectic? So you mm. were jumping from dub and reggae to, to you know, stone singles from the early 60s to, mm-hmm. you know, um, um, post-punk anthems. It was, it was more, more like a sort of pop, pop mashup disco. Yeah. Um, and that, but that came really, really easily to me. Um, and I quite enjoyed the fact it didn't, require the same you know shopping online for obscure records and mm-hmm. spending hours down at rpm and um you know or shopping at honest john's for it wasn't the same vogue for obscurities and unknowns mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i quite enjoyed the fact that it was a lot looser yeah um, uh, i mean the cow it, it, it was, it's kind of an an old tra- uh, traditional pub like where you can get like um it's like this really cool place of like pie and peas kind of earthy pub, mm-hmm. like traditional London Cockney uh, pub. But it, the people who were coming in weren't your ordinary people. You're getting people like um, Tom Cruise, like waltzing in, and David Beckham and mm-hmm. Stella McCartney. And I mean, it's like every pub should be. It was a pub that had painters and decorators and celebrities mm. and all that sitting cheek by jowl and. Mm-hmm. They all, in a way, knew each other, and no one ever really bothered each other. But um, I mean, it was one of those sort of rules the place had that you don't start photographing people and right. and all that stuff. Um, it was a very friendly, um, uh, very very friendly kind of environment, and mm-hmm. very welcoming. And people were very appreciative of the Kai because it was, you know. Pubs were sort of dying in Notting Hill. Good mm-hmm. pubs were dying. I mean, I remember I moved back to Newcastle in twenty six end of twenty sixteen, and was back down in Notting Hill about a year later. I remember, and I couldn't believe how many things had closed down. Right. With um with the rent racks, rack, the rents racking up, and you know even some sort of she she establishments had hit the wall, mm-hmm. and I mean. You know, I always think. I mean, I'm a great lover of a good pub, yeah. Um, because they're more than just a place that sells alcohol, yeah. Um, they're kind of part community centre, part therapy centre. Um, you mm-hmm. know, uh, part newsstand. Um, they 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 stand in. If they weren't there, mm-hmm. life would be a lot more alienated, especially yeah. in a world now where 
even without a lockdown, folk are used to getting their groceries delivered and not supporting local shops. And, yeah. you know, there's a whole ecosystem there that I think is very important. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, I mean, London I mean, always has a sort of a bad rep for many, for many folk in the north, but I, I generally find kind of, you know, what's good about English people is that they fly the flag well for what's good about humanity in general. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, weirdly, the kind of, you know, I think being an asshole doesn't work on a national basis. Mm -hmm. You get assholes everywhere and all of that. And people who go out of their way to be nasty, to vilify other people. And But I I, I find in my time here folk incredibly friendly. I can't imagine not Mm -hmm. having lived here for 20-something years because it's been... um, it's it's been really fantastic, and of course mm-hmm. you get periods of life that you want to sleep through, and they're not. Mm-hmm. But that's not down to people. That can just be often bad choices in other other areas of life. But um, whether London or Newcastle, I find folk generally um, it's been really really enjoyable and welcoming yeah. and optimistic, and, uh, and and I find London a lot more communitarian than mm-hmm. than I actually thought. Um, so, so the cow was in Notting Hill, mm-hmm. um, and then I haven't actually been in the cow. I've been on the website and had a look around, and I mm-hmm. quite like the website. Yeah. Um, and it's got a couple of shots, uh, like celebrities yeah. in there. Like I think I think I've seen Tom Cruise and David Beckham in the same oh, shot yeah. in in the, yeah. in the pub. But um, c- could you talk to us about how you ended up? playing Stella McCartney's <laughs> Christmas party, pri- uh, a private Christmas party? Oh, uh, well, you see, it's, I was travelling back down from uh, from Newcastle and I'd done my week's work and I was really tired and, you know, more often than not, sometimes the, the train gets delayed and mm-hmm. and I'm a, I'm a smoker, mm-hmm. so not being able to smoke and the train being delayed is a double kind of whammy. But this sounds really nostalgic talking about trains and smoking and because they were back in the days so we could go places. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but I, and I'd also look forward to getting and it was it was the last week of term before Christmas. Mm-hmm. And all I wanted to do was to I had this routine. You'd get off at King's Cross, get in the underground, you know, take the Hammersmith and City line off, get off at Royal Oak, wheel me bag down straight into the cow, even before I go home. Straight at the cow, yeah. Straight at the cow. Might even do some DJing that night yeah. um, and have a few pints. And that's and it's come up to Christmas, work's done. Mm-hmm. Get to the cow and the door's locked. And um, Barman comes out, oh, so it's Stella McCartney's Christmas party, you know, um, you know, invite only job. And they went, oh, okay. So I'm really disappointed. I've been in a delayed train and all that. But I go across the road to the bar across the road to Westbourne. And, of course, everybody that's a local in the car that couldn't get in sitting over there. Oh, and, of right. course, the only subject of conversation is the fact that they prefer to be over there and couldn't get in mm. and all that. You know, yeah. people are, yeah. oh, man, party on, I want to... Yeah. And, and um, anyway, um, Pedro, the head barman, finds me in the car and says, no, do, you know, do you not answer your phone? I'm going, oh, no, sorry, I, I have it switched. I'd like the quiet coach and the, the, the train, so I had my phone switched to silent. Anyway, what, what, what's it? Oh, Stella McCartney's uh, really crestfallen. She saw that you didn't get in, and um, she'd like you to come and do the DJ and downstairs. Oh, wow. Um, so, and Akio, your friend, who incidentally used to work with Peter Savile, you know, he did the Blue Monday cover. Right. Great, great, great graphic designer. Um, uh, one of the folk I, I really, really miss, but I'm rambling again so we go over and this is kind of quite surreal thinking oh we're Stella McCartney's kind of party and I don't know Stella McCartney very well mm-hmm. you know we, we just know each other to kind of for years I've been saying I'm crap with celebrities I just thought there's yeah. a nice woman called Stella yeah and then and I think after about a year I find out oh, that Stella's Stella McCartney oh okay and I prefer it's that way around because right. then you just become friends with people and they Mm-hmm. You just get on. Oh, so you uh, didn't you didn't realise? No, no. But for about the f- first year I lived in Notting Hill, I just thought she was Stella, and I don't mean that genuinely. And right. Then I, then I found out that Stella was Stella McCartney. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I'm cr- I mean, I I'm so bad with celebrity. I actually thought for years that Jordan and Katie Price were different people. 
Oh, all right. Yeah. Just because I heard these names bandied around and didn't know that. They yeah. Were. So, but it's good to keep your head out of celebrity type stuff. I, th- I think they probably are in her, in her head. I mean, who knows? You know, but uh, knows? I can kind of get where you come from with that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, but I mean, the lovely thing was I, I, I we sort of DJ and thought this was a bit surreal, and I, I sat up and I said, "Aki, would you mind looking after my gear there?" Well, um, I just I just haven't smoked enough cigarettes. Yeah. So, so I wanted to go out, and it's a short walk. You know, just from me to you, pretty much from the where the, you DJ to the front door. Mm-hmm. So I just go in, and the next thing I just pull the door open, and there's a guy, you know, he, the timing thing. He's oh, he's, he's, coming, yeah. he's just missed it because I pulled the door open. Got you. Yeah. He nearly fell into the place. All right. Wasn't a good look. Good job. There's no paparazzi out there because it was Bono. Oh wow. And I just went, oh, mind your step there, fella. And then he goes, oh. <laughs> comes in, and then he's followed by Penelope Cruz, Kylie Minogue. And being a post-punk kid from back in the day, uh, his friend Gavin Friday, who was this, you know, friend of the Virgin Prunes. Right. So I thought, OK. Uh, and then I look around at Akio. He looks, this is not going to be an ordinary night. Yeah. So I end up kind of DJing with this sort of... For this kind of all these folk around. And, um, and then um, folk know that I'd made the video for YouTube's thing years ago and uh-huh. so they're wondering am I gonna when am I gonna speak to this it's a bit of a theatre for everybody when, when am I gonna speak to Bono? When's when's that moment gonna happen? And <laughs> but I didn't I didn't have any great desire to speak to Bono. But then it kind of sort of I can't remember exactly what happened. But um his bouncer was his minder was sitting down with us while we were DJing. And he was just sitting there, so we're yarning away with him. And then I think Bono came into the conversation through that. And then the, I got talking to the bouncer, and it was, oh, yeah, you're so da da da. And then talk about faux pas, I ended up, you know, this was the time that there was all the hoo ha about you two not paying their tax. Mm. So we ended up having an argument about tax. Oh, wow. So you were rowing with them. And I wasn't, not, not, not no, shouting. no, I wasn't doing any of that. I mean, it was, it was just basically, I said, look, I mean, it's really, really crazy because, I mean, surely from your own PR perspective, and I'm not saying that's the best r- motivation, but surely wherever you're kind of like not paying in tax, you're paying in PR because you mean you must know that your reputation, particularly in among English music fans, is pretty much as low as you could go. It was. It uh, was actually getting. Uh, I was reading about you two and the you know the biggest band in the world, and then about it just so happens the time when you were having this mm-hmm. row with them, they were starting to go on the slide. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel because the I read this quote like they were, they were one of the most hated bands in in the world at one point, but one of the best loved, then mm-hmm. the the most hate, uh, hated bands in the world. Well, I think I mean I mean uh, I mean. He, a, a clever enough response to that because you're sure like I mean we're, we're you know we're not exactly kind of loved in our hometown either mm-hmm. and I mean and so we went through this thing and I said look but I mean relative to your income would it not be better just for all concerned would it not be a more of an an everybody win scenario and he he said look what you have to understand is that I mean What's the exact phrase he used? Yeah, our tax arrangements are wholly commensurate with EU law. And I thought, what a phrase, wholly commensurate with EU law. So I was kind of processing this and he kind of looked at me as if to say, something wrong with that? And I kind of went, yeah, I'm just sort of thinking about it. This is like, it's, it's because, I mean, I'm of a generation where I can remember growing up with your music and and for us there was a great deal of pride that I mean I didn't like you two as much as the sort of the more electronic bands when I was younger but that's neither here nor there but there was this mm. pride in them a band from Ireland that was that was good mm. that had that energy mm-hmm. and a kind of charismatic front man and all of that mm-hmm. and so I remember just sort of thinking yeah you just sound less like the guy that used to inspire young folk of my generation who were Irish and now you just sound more like your lawyer. 
And then he went, OK, so what would you do if you were me? I'd pay my tax. Mm -hmm. And then he left, and he left in a real hurry. And Pedro, the barman, he thought this really... He, he did the, the kind of the theatre of pretend to take away some of the bar furniture in case we were going to use it as weapons. But it was just, oh, it was wow. just, but it was just a bit of theatre. It, it was, was a, a bit, bit of fun to try and mm -hmm. sort of soften it. But he left so quickly that he left his kind of bespoke jacket behind. And then the bar man, the overall bar manager, who's incidentally Irish, he thought, great, I'm going to have that auctioned on eBay. Right. It's going to be my fortune. Of course, somebody was sent to retrieve the jacket. Oh, the well, the, someone the said day, it, uh, the next day. was sent again. Yeah, but, um, I mean, I, wasn't being, I really wasn't being a smart ass. It no. was just, I was really, like anybody, I was just quite... I just don't understand why the super rich um, need to evade tax. Mm -hmm. Uh I mean, I'm not suggesting that we return to the days of the Beatles where, under Harold Wilson, the Beatles were paying 90% of their income in tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's 90p out of every pound in tax. Mm -hmm. Didn't stop the Beatles becoming incredibly rich. Yeah, of course. Um, but there seems to be this dual rule where folk are left scrambling around. And the, the threshold of now scrambling around has affected even those who you used to sort of be security middle class and mm -hmm. had some distance from anxiety but i think uh, a lot of us are scrambling around well the the the, the sort of the super rich mm -hmm. get a get a get a free pass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know i believe in taxation that way i mean i think there's a debate about what you do with tax i don't want to get people paying tax for unjust wars but if taxation starts to protect and preserve public bodies if it could have protected higher education remaining in the public sector, if it stops the National Health Service getting privatised, let's mm -hmm. get on with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you'd have, to, you'd have to have particular nations all agreeing to, um, to instigate this, because, of course, then that all you need is one tax haven and those companies will base themselves there. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that's corrupt. That's, that's what's wrong at the heart of capitalism yeah yeah anyway sorry i've gone off on a no no i'm just i've gone off on a slight soapbox with no, that no, which i didn't i didn't kind of it's absolutely really cool. intend to. Um, i'm just trying i'm just trying to think yeah um I've, I've just got a picture of of uh bono just wearing his cow his cowboy <laughs> but of course uh, and um and I'm just wondering, do you think he recognised it at all from... No, I didn't even... I didn't from even, that... No, I didn't... I didn't even say who I was from... From... From back in the day, because yeah. I'd met um, Bono with... Um, through Eamon from Basic and stuff mm -hmm. way back, but mm -hmm. I, I, there was no... I mean, there's no... You know, it's an undignified conversation, isn't to go in and say, oh, remember me? Remember me, me I yeah. Yeah, once, we were at once, but at once upon a time made, you know... Made a video for your yeah. dance label. Um, I, I, I just thought he might have just looked and went, oh, yeah, and maybe put two and two together when you start chatting. Mm. Like, you know how people just have penny drops and it's like, well, oh, I, think I remember you. But even if he did, I think I looked kind of a bit different you mm. know, from, mm -hmm. from, from those days. So it's a, um, I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested to hear your opinion on when, um, because like I'm a bit of a fan of you uh you too but not how how can i put it not not so much the early early stuff mm -hmm. uh, i've really gone into them um you you're probably going to hear this and go ah, but i really got into them um post rattling hum mm -hmm. when the when the cuz i um i'm kind of re really interested in when people bands brands reinvent themselves yeah and um and i'm you know i find that when they reinvented themselves and done the Zoo TV and the uh, Actong Baby uh, album and all the rest of it, I kind of thought they hit the nail on the head. And um, yeah, I think I'm that's just this, interested yeah. to hear what what you think about. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the it's, to, to many that's certainly their finest moment, mm -hmm. and I think it's the fact that it's such a, a radical reinvention. Yeah, I mean there aren't many reinventions. Um, that are quite such a pendulum swing, yeah, and that occur in uh, on that kind of scale. Yes, uh, I mean, I mean, Irish 
rock and popular music generally at that point in time was never really associated with playfulness and plasticity mm -hmm. and electronica and I mean it was a sort of novel kind of stadium kraut rock almost that they dabbled in. Uh, Mick um, talks about that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, one of the things I was very flattered about when Rock and Pop in Ireland came out was that well, Mick actually read the whole thing, and mm. and um, I was glad he liked some of the arguments in the book about mm -hmm. that Achtung Baby Zoo TV Zeropa kind of period. Mm -hmm. um, but then, where do you go after? Uh, where do you go after such a reinvention? Yeah, um, it, it's. I mean, there's always it's it's there's only so much stylistic novelty that rock and pop can really incorporate mm -hmm. to the point where novelty itself and reinvention mm -hmm. as Bowie discovered becomes expected mm -hmm. um, and then you have the Prince problematic where you're just so utterly talented that consumers get bored with the fact that you're yeah. just incredibly talented yeah. and then it's then you're into that well that, that album wasn't as good as the last one and, and you're into that um, sort of cul-de-sac mm. um, you know music's a incredibly fickle um, um, but I like I suppose I just get it I'm very attracted when when music and politics meet and I don't mean politics with a capital P but mm -hmm. politics in terms of smaller scale representational politics politics and meaning politics of style and sound and mm -hmm. I mean the the Zoo TV thing was important for you know taking a hand grenade to the usual repertoire of Irish imagery among many other things um, you know, you don't often, as I say, get Ireland associated with modernity and science mm -hmm. fiction. And I mean, I was showing actually some of the students that in a, in a modular third year module I teach, I was showing them some of the opening of Zoo TV. Oh, uh, brilliant! Just to show the scale of yeah. what was going on with the big global artists at the time that it's were were big. forced into playing stadiums in the political economy of the time, and and you see this thing that looks like Blade Runner. It's clearly yeah. very much inspired by the sets for that, you know, magnificent neo-noir sci-fi film. Yeah. Um, and that playfulness is a lot of, a lot of fun. Just the, the cutting and the, like the, the, the juxtaposition and of, of everything. I want a better word. It's just like a regurgitation of, mm. of all kinds of media just thrown, just thrown at you. What I really loved uh, about it is it had two things going on at the same time where the guy underneath, mm. underneath the stage was kind mm. of, kind of a journalism, live, journalistic approach to it where I, you, did, you didn't really know what was going on, but there was like a, a narrative with mm -hmm. the songs and then him chatting about, they were playing live upstairs mm -hmm. and then he was actually talking about something quite different about the technology and how many uh, miles of cable are going through yeah and, this and, is and also doing. open about the fact that they've got people kind of manning the computers and the sequencers yeah. to make so it's not just the four guys on stage there's, there's an underground crew like, of people yeah. making the sound i mean that was really novel back in in um i think in 1991 92 uh -huh. to 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 reveal the the edifice uh -huh. i mean it's a collective thing in another way because um, eno and uh kevin godley and other people were involved in the kind of the creation of you know that Zoo TV extravaganza and, and uh -huh. a, set, a set designer called Willie Williams. Yeah, and you know it's, it's another sort of testament to the power of collaboration. Uh -huh. um, but then, where do you go after such an extravaganza? You know, uh, you know, where do you go if you're Prince and you've just done Sign of the Times, the tour? Mm -hmm. It's uh, all sorts of difficulties. Mm -hmm. and then you, you then you find this odd trajectory when you're um, you've made your best work then. When is it that you sort of then all happens to the Rolling Stones? Mm -hmm. You know, you folk just want to really hear the greatest hits. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm just want, here to hear yeah, the yeah. Folk want sort of you know. I mean, it's a it's a it's a real problem. And um, I mean, who goes along to the Stones gigs wanting to hear stuff from the last album? Yeah, it's you know they want the Gimme Shelter and and you know so sort of like it's, yeah. it's kind of like Gimme Shelter to start me up is that mm -hmm. sort of era. Yeah, play all of that, please. <laughs> and uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe throw in "Love Is Strong" or something from the was that from the nineties. But yeah, it's it's a it's it's a hard one for folk to escape. Yeah, um, well, the the, the whole zoo uh, zoo teeth uh, TV thing always 
also reminded us of um, uh, a guy called Josh Harris, and he mm-hmm. and he made a film, We Live in Pub public mm-hmm. it kind of reminded us of that underground society of people uh, caught sort of a um, precursor to big brother kind of thing mm-hmm. um, so I thought that was quite in- interesting uh, I just wanted to hear what you thought about you two and uh, <laughs> well, I, I, mean, was, I, I think I was I, interested I, I always think like I'm a sort of like most hopefully like most sort of Irish folk I I kind of love them and loathe them in equal measure. Yeah. It, de- it, it, it depends on the... I mean, for a long time, I think it... Um, I mean, the, the the flip side to them having this sort of sense of pride as a youngster of, you know, an Irish band getting into the, the, the firmament mm-hmm. was a really important thing, mm-hmm. you know, that was modern and, you know, could sort of hold their own alongside sort of Joy Division and mm-hmm. some of the... You know, I mean, Joy Division fans are going to balk when you hear that. You know, go, oh no, you two were never as good as Joy Division. I mean, I mean, these these things to a degree are always subjective. It's all you know. You, you'll, you'll find your 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 um, detractors and mm-hmm. your and your praisers and mm-hmm. so on. Mm-hmm. But it was that sense that playing a role that that, that you know, one sort of upon a time, you know, the one of the most globally successful groups. Was was an Irish group because we, we yeah. it, it didn't you didn't have the same long history of it where it was kind of retained in the way that had been the case in Britain ever since the British invasion of the that was set in motion by the Beatles in early nineteen sixty four. Mm-hmm. But there's been a whole sea of you know British acts that were popular in America and critically lauded. Um, so you two were important in that way. Yeah. But then, you know, you it's like a lot of other things. It, it, it sets a template. Mm-hmm. And I remember living in Dublin around about at some point in the 1980s. I was down there for a while. It was 89, can't remember. But I just remember you know, wanting to try and find a quiet pub where there wasn't someone that was doing either U2 covers or sounded like a bad version of U2 right. playing full pelt in a, in a pub. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it sort of set a temp, this sort of template for what a, a kind of an Irish sound would be, you mm-hmm. know, edge type guitar, spacious, mm-hmm. windswept sounding. And you thought, oh God, you know, it's like the, it's like the Alan Partridge line. There's more to Ireland than this. You know, you were thinking, yeah, God, there's got to be more Ireland than this fucking sound. <laughs> and and, you know, so it's like a you know a diversity of means is mm-hmm. is really really helpful. I think I mean things are a lot more interesting. I think in Ireland and Northern Ireland now musically because of the the, the big record companies don't have it their way. So mm-hmm. you've got lots of smaller record labels managing to survive doing business through other networks. Mm-hmm. And I think there's probably still too many Irish sensitive singer songwriters. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be a form that we we. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's an odd paradox, isn't it? This is supposed to be quite individualistic, the individual singer-songwriter, but yet it's a form we remake with a certain regularity. Yeah. Uh, always very emotional, mm-hmm. and that becomes the sort of the Irish trademark. Um, I mean, I mean, again, diversity of means is good, but there's a lot of interesting other stuff going on, but I probably know as much about what's going on in, a, in Newcastle musically as I do about... Belfast. All right. Um, it's different when you get to the 1960s, of course, because mm-hmm. I've been kind of living in the 1960s because of the present book for the last sort of five years. Right. So um, that's... Um, yeah, yeah, no, so um, you're still in London. You, you still de- DJing. Um, you're kind of in between Newcastle and London, but you were writing a lot of articles about Brian Eno. Yeah, no, well, I, only, I wrote one piece on, oh, right. on, on Brian Eno, um, which I was very flattered to do. It came out in two forms, so it mm-hmm. came out in a, a lovely collection um, just called Brian Eno with Bleak Music. Because Brian Eno, weirdly, in um, sort of academic criticism, popular music studies and popular music history, isn't as widely written about um, as, you'd, mm. as, you, as you'd think. Yeah. So uh, I was flattered to... to contribute a chapter to that book about his relationship with 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 Ireland because you know I mean 
what everyone thinks of Eno's collaboration with U2. He's he's made more albums with U2 than than any other mm-hmm. collaboration. These and uh, and also it's one he talks about himself right. very very fondly. Wow. But it doesn't have the same sort of critical purchase, say, as his albums with. Um, I don't know, Robert Fripp or the three albums he produced for Talking Heads or mm-hmm. um, um, or his work with early Roxy Music. Um, but, I mean, I think it's an interesting collaboration, so I tried to have a go about, you know, writing about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always loved the sort of the company of musicians. I mean, yeah. DJs and musicians. I mean, um Big Frank, Frank Manseeds is versatile and clever a vocalist and lyricist as I've come across anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you learn a lot from uh, friendship with musicians and, mm-hmm. and, and the way that they think and work. And I try to fold that into the way that I approach music as a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the way folk approach production as a an important part of the story rather than just sort of you know trying to kind of read the music off the surface yeah as it were i'm interested in music's relationship to history and um it's exciting also when you you over the years you make friends with probably worked in music for a long time Mm -hmm. like frank like um my late friend roger pomfrey um a friend of mine gregory gray um sadly those last two figures have passed away but um, musicians are amazing to learn things mm-hmm. from and the way that they set about doing doing their work, particularly if they've been, they've sustained a career mm-hmm. making music um, over a long period of time. You uh, you probably know this more than me know, but um, was Brian Eno kind of uh, an innovator of uh, ambient music? I think it's his sort of... Um, it's it's kind yes, of coined he, the phrase. I think he coined the phrase. I mean, there's there's certainly a, a form of music that's meditative and minimalist, and uh-huh. and lords the non musician. There's a there's a long tradition of that in advance of Eno, but Eno uh-huh. certainly did popularise the the notion of of ambient music, particularly with um, you know, uh, music for films and, and yeah. That. I mean, I I I, I love that work partly because I'm I'm in lockdown, and I, I can work to it. And yeah, it gets you in a a sort of an interesting meditative space, mm-hmm. you know, and much as I sort of love funk and soul, if it's a bit too raucous, it doesn't kind of work in the middle of the day if I'm trying to... You're trying to work. Trying to kind of compose something. Yeah, it's all cool. about kind of music and context. Um, Do you... Um, I'm just try, trying to get these out quickly. Um, oh, don't rush it, Cliff. We no, just, no. We can just sort of, yeah. Um, I'm uh, beginning to ramble a wee bit anyway, I think. No, no, it's uh, fine, it's fine. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of the story about Brian Eno you know, talks about uh, how kind of ambient music came about um, when he got hit by a cab. Uh, he got oh, no, knocked down. No, I don't know that story at all. All no. oh, right, I know a story that uh, you don't know about. Wow. Well, oh, no, no, <laughs> no, that's, no, that's I, I'm easy to catch out with stuff like that, don't worry. <laughs> he got, um, I, I just thought I'd swing this by you. He got hit by a cab in 1967, 1975. Mm-hmm. Um, he was, I don't know if he went to hospital, but he was, he couldn't walk. Or he was uh, bedridden. Um, his girlfriend brought him a record of harp music. So he put they put that on a um like a, a record player, um and then as he was so ill in bed, the the record player only had one channel, it didn't work so good and the volume was so low down and he couldn't get out couldn't get up out of bed to turn it mm-hmm. up. So it kind of invented the, his different way of hearing. Mm-hmm. So he was hearing this harp music. And then he says it paved the way for an idea of ambient m- music where mm. he would hear the na- inspiration for ambient music. Well, that's a wonderful story. So I just uh, thought I'd share, I'd share was, that with there, you. There were, wee, there were wee parts of that that um, seemed familiar to yeah. me, particularly when you, talk, when, you, you know, when you mentioned the idea of the harp music and it mm. being far away. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, I'm not, I don't know whether I read that in sleeve notes or read right. that somewhere. Um, uh, in the past, I mean, there's a wonderful somebody Shepherd that did a who, did, who wrote a, I think it's the most complete sort of biography of Eno. Mm-hmm. And it's a, 
I haven't read it for years, but it's one of those I like rereading stuff if it's any good. Yeah. So I might go back and you should have a... explore that again. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's, it's it's a strange thing when you get to a certain age, mm-hmm. Cliff, really, because you you realise that when you're younger, you think that you, you're going to be able to dabble in life in a lot more than mm-hmm. than time really affords you. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I I. I I wonder how many more books I'll have the opportunity to write. Um, and then I often ask myself, I wonder if I'll ever have the opportunity to DJ again, mm-hmm. uh, let alone DJ regularly, or do I want to? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's odd, you know, because when you're young, of course, you think you might be a deep sea diver, you might be a train driver, you might, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. you might sort of put, be, be an astronaut. Mm-hmm. And the world seems full of all these different roles that you could play. And, uh, yeah, you get to a point, I think, where you begin to... You know, especially when you've lived through something like this, this COVID thing, you think, God, life is so contingent and mm-hmm. so, so fragile mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and a lot shorter. Mm-hmm. Than, and I'm just, you know, I'm just pleased, I think, more than anything else to have the opportunity to, to do some, be able to do some things that I've greatly enjoyed. Because uh, e- even getting the chance to do something that you, you greatly enjoy, you often feel, do you ever feel like you're fighting in life to get close to something that you want to be doing, but the world's continually yeah. holding, holding you back from Gosh. getting there? Of course, uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, yeah, um, God, I hope that doesn't sound self-satisfied. It's not meant to sound like that at all. It's just, um, yeah, I just like to, I'd like to think I've got another, mm-hmm. maybe another book. Um, what I'm sure it, you have. What was it? What it? What it'll be about? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, I started to write a little bit about life under lockdown, mm-hmm. and uh, and then I sort of I lost track of doing that. I didn't know what forum to do it for, and and it also seemed a little bit narcissistic and navel gazing because, well, you know, you're by necessity inside, and um, but. Writing kind of helps to make sense of things, mm-hmm. even if you never intend to publish it, or it's, yeah. it, it, it it always helps explain something. Oh yeah, of course. Um, you actually wrote um, a obituary for Roger Pumphrey, and the in the Guardian. In, yeah, yeah. I just thought that uh, yeah, this yeah. is worth uh, mentioning because oh, you know yeah, I, I know yeah. he was a good friend of yours. Oh, he was a wonderful, uh, wonderful human being. I mean, I think. Um, humorous, generous, uh, very very talented musician. He was the first guitarist in Eurythmics. In the Eurythmics, yeah. Um, when um, I mean, Dave Stewart's a mean guitarist. Yeah. But he he went to play bass, and Roger played the lead guitar, and and the rhythm section was Clem Burke of Blondie, and mm. um, and then Holger Zuki from Can was uh, mm. doing electronics and fugelhorn mm-hmm. with the band. So he, these were his bandmates, and. Uh, then he left Eurythmics, and of course they went on to become global with Sweet yeah. Dreams. And but he ended up. But he also wrote um, Terence Trent D'Arby's Wishing Well, but was never credited I for s- it. I've seen that. I've seen and, that. Yeah. And then uh, bless him, he he made a one. He became a music filmmaker. Yeah. Um, made some wonderful stuff. My my favourites, um, uh, The Alchemists of Sound, a documentary he made about the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and mm-hmm. Delia Derbyshire and. And that's a very innovative and interesting piece of work. Um, but, yeah, he, he was a great, just a great friend. He um, all, uh, he, um, I hate to end, end up, but he also yeah. um, directed uh, Massive Attacks. Uh, first, first video, yeah. First I mean, yeah, yeah, they were, they were. Um, I've got for, for, I'd forgotten about that clip. Yeah. I'm not going to forget about that. Um, yeah, and it, it's odd. I've, uh, I've been in... Uh, Roger's company with members of Massive Attack and and they all I mean, I mean at Roger's fu- funeral they all confessed to me that, that we we all still kind of look up to him as a mm. as a father figure because he advised us about not just making videos but aspects of you know how to kind of set about collaborating because we we were a collective that didn't have a lead singer mm-hmm. and in those days we weren't. We weren't associated with any particular interests, in- instruments. Our music was sample based. Mm-hmm. So Roger was a real innovator, but um, uh, a generous friend. But I didn't set out to write his obit for the Guardian. It was yeah. um, 
I, I wanted my another late friend, uh, the great music writer Dave Lang, to to do it. I mean, um, you should look at Dave. Dave's written a lot of obits on music for The Guardian, and they're beautifully written and they're very entertaining. Mm -hmm. But I sort of worked it up for uh, Dave to do the research, and he said, no, well, I've presented it to The Guardian, and I pitched it to them that you should do it. And I ended up... Um, ended up writing it and uh, then then you feel the pressure yeah. you have to do your friend justice and yeah. uh, and I'm not used to writing within about five six hundred words which is all you've got then yeah. how do you make an interesting career not sound like a CV mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean mm -hmm. how do you yeah, inject the personality into it mm -hmm. so there was a set of issues around getting all that right um, but it was uh, yeah yeah Roger passed away in at the start of 20. 2014 mm -hmm. um, in London in some ways it wasn't really the same but uh, but through him I've met, I met a lot of very interesting folk and um, he used to direct a series called Rotten Hill TV for yeah. for the Rotten Hill Gang and anyone out there who's listening I mean go and google the Rotten Hill Gang um, I think it's a particular favourites they do a cover of Submission by the Sex Pistols mm -hmm. um, uh, also on YouTube and it has, it's actually Glenn Matlock and, and Steve Jones, or sorry, Glenn Matlock and Paul Cook, the original Sex Pistols rhythm section, yeah. uh, the rhythm section for this, because mm -hmm. the Rotten Hill Gang pulled in a lot of old punk. I've seen it on YouTube, Aristocracy, yeah. and, yeah. um, and I mean, all, all, all those folk became, all our um, very dear friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of, Mick Jones is kind of like the, the godfather of sorts of the, of the Rotten Hill Gang, um, mm -hmm. and and the wonderful Gary McPherson, um, and Holly Cook and others. Um, uh, I, I just love the, I love the spirit, because they make music for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in being signed. They're interested in just keeping going and ha having a bit of creative independence, Yeah, releasing stuff when they can. But a lot of it's about community events and keeping things going around the area. Mm -hmm. And... and you know, I hate to use the cliche keeping it real, but yeah. they're kind of doing that, and that's a very valuable thing, um, especially when you get older, because you're supposed to sort of go out to pasture, aren't you? But they all, mm -hmm. they all kind of keep it pretty vital. Yeah, they're still gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, I uh, I subscribe to the U uh, YouTube channel, and they're still yeah. there. Seems to be a band there now, like a band that are doing quite a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, well, the Rotten Hill Gang are, you know, I mean, I love it's a great name for a band. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of got the Ant Hill mob, what yeah. the races kind of feel about it. But it's also, I like the, the mixing up Rotten with Notting Hill in a way, because yeah. it, it has a spark of critique against gentrification and mm -hmm. all of that. And, 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 and Mick Jones is a, a, a gentle and kind soul. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bit of a shock. I mean, I don't want to sound too starstruck, but, you know, it's an odd thing to be sitting DJing in the car and you've got you know, Mick Jones standing next to you, kind of having his pint and enjoying the music. And uh, and then asking him to make a wee compilation tape yeah. of some stuff if he, don't, if he doesn't know it. Um, uh, but, I mean, um, the most important thing is that it's not that folk are celebrities or historically famous. It's just it's it's just nice when people are creative and interesting and mm -hmm. and they, they have a, a modicum of interest in yourself and, mm -hmm. and that works like that. Um, it's part of keeping curious and keeping life adventurous and you know trying to keep the inner kid in yourself so yeah. you don't become too cynical and adult and mm -hmm. world weary and that's a challenge for all oh, of us oh of course it is of course yeah. it is um, no we'll kind of come to come come towards the end but it's been it's Cliff, been absolutely brilliant Cliff thank you very much and I'm sorry if I rambled on to no, arbitrarily me, me. and um but um, thank you very 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 much and and uh i think you're the only person who could possibly kind of coax me out of the house oh really uh, but sorry you have to be sitting here wearing a kind of a same yeah. visor you can tell i'm not used to it because i keep kind of going to you keep going to touch my, it yeah. yeah i keep going to scratch the tip of my nose or something and it's um yeah and i forget that it's here um just before we all split and go and go off into the night um could you just tell about your latest book? No, uh, oh, how, my pleasure. How Belfast yeah, Got the Blues. Yeah, How Belfast Got the Blues, a, a cultural history of the 1960s. Um, 
yeah, it's a, a very much a music and politics book. Um, it's not a local interest book where mm-hmm. you're going to read about what you know Belfast bands that you never heard about. Mm-hmm. It actually looks at it uses one city to go into the broader story of the relationship between music and politics, both sides of the Atlantic mm-hmm. in the 1960s. You know, music's connection to to civil rights, uh, music's connection to the Northern Ireland state. Uh, tell some stories not widely known, such as the Rolling Stones' relationship to Belfast and how Belfast might have played a role in the Stones becoming public enemy number one. Um, uh, how the Stones played in the city three times within 18 months and never returned after September 1965. All right. Um, I mean, it's, there's a lot of intrigue there and mm-hmm. tells uh, the story of one particular female blues singer that um, might be knowledge to some blues collectors, but she's an important part of our Belfast story because she um, she was there ahead of Van Morrison, basically. Mm-hmm. And most folk could be forgiven for thinking that, well, first successful Irish blues singer... Oh, that's Van Morrison. And the Maritime Hotel, 1964, kickstarts Morrison's career. The cover of Baby Please Don't Go, charting and all of that. There's a story before that. Right. So it's it's using a single city as a lens to go into the rock, pop and politics relationship mm-hmm. in a decade that we all kind of think we know. <laughs> right. You know, because right, the 60s are such a big place in our present doesn't it of course yeah you know? so that's what that endeavors to do and it's uh because i hate to do the old book, pl- book plug thing but it's 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 i think it's going to be available to buy on the 4th of september you right know, you know through amazon and all the usual sort of um uh stockists but i'm immensely proud of it mm. in part because i've got a genius of a co-author and um that helps an awful lot mm-hmm. um uh my co-author Joanna Branoff is one of the brightest people in terms of making critical connections I've had the good fortune to work with. Oh, wow. Well, um, we'll put the link in the description as well where you can get the book. Oh, you we'll, don't need to do that. No, no we'll, we'll, we'll flash the book up as well. So, um, no, thanks thanks for coming down. I so just, thank you. I'm, I'm shocked because we're talking about Irish music and we're never mentioned Phil oh, in Phil, it. there he is in bless his, him and he's one of my heroes oh and his magnificence oh, but, I, I mean but uh, I think that says enough just him in the background just say, uh, says enough but um, Noel thanks so much for coming down um, it's run a bit over time but it was, I think we've just got so much to talk about but uh, so thank you very much and, and I mean I, I didn't I thought it was around about yeah 8 o'clock yeah you know and I'm sorry I have to rush off because but it's uh, I've, we're doing a kind of a wee, uh, 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 so with a book retailer in the states, right? And um, I think they're going to. Rec- I'm going to. I'm going to have no voice left because I'm supposed to be recording a podcast, right? <laughs> oh, you're going to be uh, all like uh, podcasters out. Yeah, but at least I mean this with, with with your good self. I wasn't just talking about the book. This is going to be talking about the recent book. So thank you for letting me room. Uh, room free through my through my past such as it is <laughs> oh, hey, it's been an absolute pleasure no? but uh, thanks for coming down oh, thank you Cliff and thank and, uh, you very very much indeed take good care of yourself and you man thanks thank a lot you.